Today, I think we're going to find some gold for everybody out there. Mm -hmm. Let's find the gold. I think in order to see the future, where are the best resources for cybersecurity? Mm -hmm. We have to first take a walk down memory lane. It's so encouraging to see progress that I've missed in a couple of weeks. I think what the, the industry as a whole lacks right now is really storytelling, right? I want to be creative and create something that I feel like solves a problem that they previously had. Give yourself the goal. Once you think of the big picture, it's like, hold on. We have X, Y, Z until we get there. And then you can adapt and evolve based on that. Who says tech can't be human? What's going on, Hacker Valley fam? Welcome back to the show. Some people say we should never look back and only look forward, but looking back provides us with a chance to reflect and also to grow. So we looked back at some of our episodes in 2023 and put together some of the best clips with great advice and insights into being more creative, reflective, and resourceful. Maybe you can use some of this information to inspire you going into 2024 whether you want to be better at using AI or write a book or just be better at finding resources that you could use, this is the show for you. We couldn't put everything in a single show though. So if you want to jump into any of the episodes that are brought up, be sure to check out the description or show notes wherever you're listening to listen to those full episodes. We wanted to thank you from the bottom of our heart for all of the support and listening to the show and supporting Hacker Valley Media. We have a lot more in that store for 2024. We hope that you have a great new year. And without further ado, enjoy the show. One of the cool things that you showed me with ChatGPT is that you can then take this prompt and this fictitious character and start asking it questions. Mm -hmm. You know, we really pride ourselves on being creative in cybersecurity. So right. I think it would only be right if we asked it a question that might help us day in and day out. Mm -hmm. And we create content. We spend a lot of time on planning our episodes. Let's go ahead and ask it a question about how it would create cybersecurity episodes mm. in relation to chat GPT. I love it. Let's do it. All right, let's check out episode one, Uncovering Fraud with Chat GPT. Okay, there's a little bit of an introduction here. The introduction, the concepts of using language models like Chat GPT for cybersecurity and explain how it can help uncover fraud. Use case one, phishing scam detection. Explain how Chat GPT can be used to analyze large amounts of email data to detect and flag phishing scams. That's pretty good. Use case number two, identifying insider threats. Oh, how's it going to do that? Explain how chat GPT can be used to analyze employee communications and behavior. I don't know how everyone else is going to feel about that one. <laughs> and then use case number three is uh, automating penetration testing. Explain how chat GPT can be used to automate penetration testing by generating natural language scripts that can be used to test the security of web applications. I think that's a pretty good use case. For I chat like GPT. that one. Oh, yeah. And I actually really like these examples that it gave us. They're a little weird. They <laughs> might not be directly one to one great episodes for chat GPT. But this is what I think is really great at is the idea generation part. It exactly. gives you ideas. It gives you a base what to work off of when you give it the prompt. And you're right. It can generate code. Mm -hmm. I will be honest. We did just release a new iteration of the Hacker Valley Studio website. Mm -hmm. And I did use ChatGPT to help me build hey, it. Hey, use what you got, all right? It's a resource. <laughs> exactly. There's a great uh, technology called Copilot. I think it's actually created by GitHub. And as you're typing into VS Code, and maybe it integrates with other editors as well, but in VS Code, as you're typing in your code, it will auto-complete and give you suggestions. And not mm -hmm. just one line like how Grammarly would do. It will give you an entire code block. And if you type in, I want to create a module for the navigation bar on my website, mm -hmm. it will write out all the code for what it thinks you want out of a navigation bar. Mm. So what do you want ChatGPT to create for you? We got to keep on this topic of being creative because I think... Mm -hmm being a creator and being creative is almost a 
a necessity in cybersecurity. You look at people that are creating courses, everyone's creating a LinkedIn course now, mm-hmm. LinkedIn Everybody. learning course. Yeah. And you look at YouTube videos, you look at conferences, you look at webinars, you look at anything that a cybersecurity practitioner has to do, a big part of it is teaching. 100%. And I think being creative and using something like ChatGPT is something that will help you get the edge in being creative. But you also had this topic, this idea that you coined and created called mm-hmm. industry creative. Yep. What exactly is it? I saw your LinkedIn newsletter. Yeah. I wanted to bring it up here on this episode because I think it's it's so important and relevant to like everything that we're seeing in the field today. I'm glad you brought it up. And, and yeah, it's something that's kind of my little pet project of, of coining this term industry creative. Think influencer, right? When right. you think influencer these days, honestly, some people even get kind of a negative reaction because they think entitled people that have too much money for- They get the almost, ick. Yeah, exactly. It's like, uh, another, another one of these <laughs> another, guys. Another influencer. <laughs> but when you look at what an influencer is at its bare bones, the, the value that an influencer has is the followership, right? Right. Usually in numbers. But when I look at something like industry creative, it's about the body of work that this person has done in their past. So you and I, we spent a long time in cybersecurity, really in the trenches, fighting all the fights, seeing all the challenges, seeing all the successes. And then we became creators. Mm -hmm. I think when you do that, when you make that transition, it makes you a much powerful creator when you can say like i'm pulling from authentic experiences sometimes you get folks that come in to say cybersecurity marketing and they're doing their best work right because they're great but they might not have the necessary context behind everything that goes into the world of a cybersecurity practitioner definitely not and usually they have to talk to people but what you could do is have someone that is of that world someone that has lived that life that is helping you create that content why does the industry need this? I had my own suspicions and you know said that I think cybersecurity practitioners are teachers, but why do we need yet another term like industry creative? I think Gary Vee said it best. Every company is going to have to become a media company. And mm-hmm. with everyone looking to create content, you're going to have to have this nexus of industry knowledge and creativity and putting them together. The best case scenario is having someone that can do both. Right. So creating and cultivating this sort of environment where someone can learn storytelling, someone can learn how to create a podcast, how can someone learn to put out uh, videos on YouTube, then that person has all the power that they need to create that content. I think it's limiting when you just have someone that just does the work and then someone that just creates. Mm-hmm. When you're the same person, it makes it easier. Could you give us a hint uh, about how you might be leveraging generative AI in the future, whether you're talking about ransomware or even other attacks as well? I mean, I think uh, people love data. Um, Data, you know, is a starting point for most people. They want to use it to help better understand their risk, how to prioritize remediation to reduce that risk. But I think what the the industry as a whole lacks right now is really storytelling, right? Um, Execs, boards, consumers want to understand it in plain English. They don't want to necessarily even look at a chart in some cases. They want someone to tell them a story. How did this, how did we get in this position? Um, what is the impact to my business, right? Or, or me personally, and what can I do to fix this and, and prevent it from happening in the future? So I think, um, the generative AI um, as a as a capability um, is going to allow a lot of industries, including InfoSec, um, to create more of a, a storytelling medium that a lot of people will consume in a slightly different way than they do today, instead of just a metric sheet. Storytelling. I, I tell everybody it's all about storytelling at the end of the day, whether you're building a program, whether you're asking for resources, but leveraging AI for storytelling is going to give somebody that leg up against the competition. And, uh, you know, for anyone that's listening, you know, they check out your content, Teach Me Cyber, and they get excited. They're like, hey, you know what? I want to be a little bit more like Jason. I want to be creative and create something that I feel like solves a problem that they previously had. What would be your one piece of advice for them to get started on their content creation journey? I, I think the biggest thing is build a system that will give you ideas, right? And what I started off with, super basic. I just read the news, right? And I had an impression 
on what I was reading. It was like that initial reaction. And so that's your spark of inspiration, right? Like that is your seed crystal that you need to tap and just let that thing spread. And so, you know, whatever industry you're in, whether it's, you know, cybersecurity, whatever, like find out where your new sources are and just read that and like tie into what your initial reaction is and write it down. And that's it. Like start with that and then take the first step into posting something, right? I started on LinkedIn and then I expanded out beyond that, right? And so wherever you're most comfortable or hell, even wherever you're least comfortable, right? Just take the leap and like post it. And you're going to find that probably no one's going to see it or (laughs) respond to it in the first case. But, you know, once you start getting going and you you start getting traction, you'll see that it's like that system kind of continues to feed itself and then you can adapt and evolve based on that. But like most importantly, build a system to collect the inspiration and then build that system to just get in the habit of posting. Sound advice, build the systems and then take the steps to get started. You can absolutely do it. Everybody is a cyber creator at the end of the day. We have a a creative mastermind that we host every month. I'll drop the link into the description for anyone that's interested in checking it out. Um, But we have creators and creatives in cybersecurity that come on and they talk about uh, some of their challenges, some of their hopes and goals. And everyone on this mastermind has said that they at some point want to write a book. You know, so for anyone that's listening, anyone that's in our mastermind, what would be that one piece of advice that you have for them to get one step closer of realizing that dream of becoming an author? Yeah, start 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 slow, but write often, right? So if you've never written anything professionally before, don't overwhelm yourself by telling yourself you're going to write a three or 400 page book. I don't need to make writing goals for myself because I've been doing this for so long. Mm-hmm. People ask me, do you set a goal for yourself for how many words you write each day? And I say, no, I, I will write however many words people are paying me to write that day. (laughs) (laughs) But if you're not in a habit of constantly writing, it might help you to start by setting a goal for yourself. I'm going to write 500 words or a thousand words each day. Mm -hmm. 500 to a thousand words is a reasonable goal for most people, as long as you're not super busy, right? Right. So make your, give yourself the goal. I'm going to write 500 to 1,000 words each day, or I'm going to write like 3,000 to 7,000 words a week. And and just do it. And don't, don't criticize your work too much. Just relax and just put your ideas onto, you know, Microsoft Word or whatever application you use. And tell your, remind yourself that if you write a sentence or two and you write it all wrong and the grammar is all wrong and the punctuation is all wrong and all that, that can all be changed easily later. The most mm-hmm. important idea when you start is just to get your words onto the screen. And one of the worst things for me in my ADHD is to, like, I like to use LibreOffice Writer, for instance. Mm-hmm. It's a boot up LibreOffice Writer and then there's like a blank document if you stare at a blank page for too long, you're going to go nuts. <laughs> so I always tell myself, put in some, put some words in there. Because when I'm working on a document and some parts of the document are already written, it's way easier. You're way less overwhelmed. There's already a structure for you to fill in, like a jigsaw puzzle, and you've got like a lot of the pieces combined already. Don't worry too much about the editing. Just get your words down. Sound advice. Just get started. Take it one piece at a time. That's the best way to move Mount Everest anyways. That's what a book feels like at times. We have some news to share with you, a member of the Hacker Valley Media family. As of 2023, we became a full-time independent cybersecurity media company, and we're committed to bringing you the most powerful, 
thought-provoking stories in the field of cybersecurity. And we learn we can't do it alone. We'd love to invite you to our exclusive Patreon community where we host a monthly mastermind where you can meet like-minded individuals in the field of cybersecurity that are trying to be more creative and be the best version of themselves that they can be. We would love if you took a second and visited patreon.com forward slash Hacker Valley Studio and we'll see you in the mastermind. There's definitely many people listening to this right now that are in cybersecurity, but want to be a little bit more creative. You've done many creative things throughout your career. What would be your one piece of advice to them to kind of introduce creativity into their world of cybersecurity? For one thing is find the platform that that maybe just getting started, finding which one uh, appeals to you or whichever one comes more easy. So if you're a writer, you know, some people are terrified when they think, to be doing what we're doing now on video. If that's not your thing, you can do screen captures of your, your desktop. Uh, you can write, you can do audio only. So I would say find an area. I mean, this is even uh, creating you know, like a GitHub account and different content there. Uh, another thing that that's really amazing on how well it helps people build a following is sharing content, stuff that other people, mm -hmm. other tools, because, uh, there's a couple people, uh, Gabrielle B on, on LinkedIn. It's amazing how she's grown her LinkedIn following. And basically she shares different pen testing tools and she's like probably quadrupled her following in probably a year or so. I mean, just, and basically she's sharing content. So sometimes that's the way people do it. Just sharing content. You can do write blogs. If you're doing try hack me hack the box, these other things or CTFs, you can do write ups on that. So there's only so many different other ways of content creation. Sometimes people forget about the written part. They only think about video or even podcasts, but you know, you've got the written form. Some people that works better for. Yep. Absolutely. That's a great recommendation. Find what works for you and then give it a shot. I think there's so there's a lot of magic that can be had with content and just stepping out of the the box of comfort in your cybersecurity career for cybersecurity practitioners like we, yeah. we have to often find the passion outside of our work just because if you just focus on your work all day you're gonna get burnt out especially yeah. over the course of many many years we have another question the next question is from ashish rajan so let's go ahead and jump into that question Hi there, my name is Ashish, I'm from Cloud Security Podcast, and this is Simba, who's our Head of Physical Security. I had a question for both of you. Now, people who are performing at their peak level and sometimes have events which are four years down the track, like the Olympics, and your today is just day one, what are some of the rituals or practices that you have adopted to maintain your focus on the prize, even though it may be four years down the track? The context for this is, in our cloud security conversation or a cyber security conversation that are projects that take a long time. And sometimes some of these projects may end up being really successful and you get a lot of, I guess, fame for it. But how do you maintain that eye on the price on an ongoing basis? Are there any rituals that you have developed that we can probably learn from? Thank you. So do you want me to go first? It doesn't okay. matter. <laughs> so for what has helped me maintain or stay on track because you have for us every four years is the olympics so it's long term so what my mom has kind of made me and my siblings do is at the beginning of every year we kind of go in write down our goals which consist of short term and long term so that we have that visual of what we're trying to accomplish so that those goals don't seem that far-fetched so once you think of the big picture it's like hold on we have X, Y, Z until we get there. Let's focus on the small ones, small wins, and then get to the bigger picture. Yeah, and one thing that I do, um, sometimes like we forget how much progress that we make in a couple of weeks or a couple of years. So for me, um, like even in my training, I'll film things even if I feel like I'm having a bad day. And then uh, I'll do that consistently and then go back and watch. And it's so encouraging to see progress that I've missed in a couple of weeks. So even like journaling or, you know, maybe you're not working out, but just like 
reminding yourself how far that you come, even when you don't recognize it. And for me too, it's so important to, to make those goals and also to fall in love with the journey of it as cliche as that sounds. Mm -hmm. Uh, because, uh, you know, I don't know if you feel this way, but like winning is awesome, but it's an adrenaline and it like, it hits you for a couple seconds. And if it's been a miserable year leading up to that or four years leading up to it, you're like, well, that wasn't quite worth everything that I just went through. Um, as, as much as you love that, um, if you don't love the process of getting there, um, and of like becoming better then the winning isn't going to cut it. And so for me, it's just remembering like falling in love with like who I am becoming in the process of it all. hundred percent. When you think about progress, sometimes we forget because we're in the thick of it. And like you were saying, whether you see pictures of yourself from like way back when or video or even sometimes like for the podcast, like sometimes I go back to episode one and I'm like, what was I doing? I I sound (laughs) terrible. Oh, goodness. But then you say, you know what? The bad days are worth it because that's really where all that growth starts to happen. There are a lot of resources out there. When we got started, there were very few. There may have been a couple books, maybe a website or two. But today, there's so many resources out there. And today, I think we're going to find some gold for everybody out there. Mm -hmm. Let's find the gold. I think in order to see the future, what are the best resources for cybersecurity? Mm -hmm. We have to first take a walk down memory lane and share our own resources. Mm -hmm. I have some, you know, technical, but also non-technical resources I'm going to share And the first one that I'll start with is people. Mm. And I think a lot of people forget about this being a cybersecurity resource. Right. Because it's not a book. It's not a podcast. It's not something that's tangible. It's a conversation. It's it's, uh, fluid. I'm glad that you mentioned people as like a resource. Because a lot of times I think people feel like they're on an island. If you had one piece of advice for someone out there about utilizing people as a resource, like what would that one piece of advice be? The piece of advice would be to start talking. Mm. There's going to be a lot of times, a lot of situations where you say something that is not intelligent. Right. Maybe you read something in a book and you say it and and you don't get the response that you're hoping for. And also, even though you do something that is really great and impactful, you might not get the recognition that you're hoping for. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in a perfect world, you do. You get a lot of excitement. You get a lot of collaboration from people. But other times it might be a month, a year for something that you said to someone to really click in. Mm -hmm. One of my very first mentors in cyber, his name is Marco Figueroa. I remember when I first met him, he he was asking me, like, what are you focused on in cyber? And I told him C++. Mm -hmm. And he told me that there was a book that I had to get. Mm -hmm. So I just met this guy. He seemed like a bright person. I wanted to impress him, but I also wanted to impress myself. I go out and I buy the book. Yeah. And the first thing that Marco does when I show him that I have the book is he says, great, now let me buy it from you. And he thanked me. He said that book was actually way more helpful for him. And I thought that he read it, <laughs> now, being someone more more senior, senior in the field. I thought right. that he had already read it, but mm. he got information from another mentor. Mm. And it was secondhand information that was passed down that actually ended up helping both of us. It established right. trust between me and Marco. Yep. But... I gave him the book because, you know, I looked up to him. I gave him the book. He paid me for it. He gave me like five dollars extra. Mm-hmm. And I ended up rebuying the book. And so we were both able to learn from it just by that one conversation. Yeah. And we're still very close friends today. Yeah, I love that. I love the the whole people aspect. Mm-hmm.